uh, with with Paul Greenberg uh, here this afternoon as our featured guest. We're we're about to get into an important and what I'm sure will be an enlightening discussion involving the human uh, exploitation of marine life. Uh, Paul's a journalist who's been uh, focusing on issues related to fish uh, for some years now. Uh, and his new book, The Omega Principle, is the third in what has evolved into a kind of a, a, a trilogy of works. His first book eight years ago, the James Beard award-winning bestseller for fish, focused on the global fisheries market and the relationship that humans have uh, with four fish, a tuna, cod, sea bass, and salmon. Paul's second book, American Catch, uh, examined why American consumption of fish from U.S. waters has declined, while seafood imports uh, to this country have soared. Uh, in the Omega Principle, Paul turns his attention to omega-3 dietary supplements, uh, capsules containing the fatty acids derived from fish and, and other sea life. Omega-3s uh, have been promoted as having exceptional health benefits for our hearts and our brains. In the case of our cardiovascular health, they're said to reduce inflammation. And in the case of our brains, they're credited with uh, sharpening our cognitive abilities. Paul examines these claims in light of the latest research and suggests that the promise of omega-3s may not be uh, what it first appeared. He also describes how the growing consumption of omega-3s is posing a, a danger to, to marine life, and that's because the harvesting of the small silvery pelagic fish to provide the supplements is disrupting oceanic food, change, uh, food chains by depriving larger fish of the smaller fish that they feed on. Uh, on a more upbeat note, at the end of his book, Paul outlines some environmentally conscious ways that we as individual consumers can continue to embrace omega-3s. And he also helpfully provides a section on sustainable fish recipes. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Paul Greenberg. Yep. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's um, well, normally I say it's great to be back in DC, but you know, situations, but what it was. Um, no, it's actually very nice to be here, um, you know, as, I've spent a lot of time coming back and forth here, both as um, somebody who's been involved with fisheries policy, but also the fact that this is, you know, right near Chesapeake Bay um, the, and the Potomac, one of the greatest fisheries that we historically had in this country. Um, so this book is this sort of funny combination of like an examination of a very specific problem, but also kind of a deeper dive into a midlife crisis. Um, so. I, uh, so as, as we, the kind man who introduced me, tell me your name one more time, Brad. as Brad told me. Um, uh, so the previous two books that I had done um, really looked at sort of more questions of environmental uh, policy and, and, and the ocean. So Four Fish, really when it came right down to it, Four Fish was about um, the fact that uh, 100 years ago, everything we ate from the ocean was wild and in the next few years, we're going to pass the point where more than half of what we eat from the ocean is coming from farms. So like epical, epical shift. So that was four fish. Um, the next book um, really was about the conflict between the fact that the United States controls more ocean than any country on Earth, and yet 90% of our seafood is coming to us from abroad. Um, when I mentioned this to a um, fishmonger in the Fulton Fish Market, um, I said to him, Herb, what do you think about the fact that um, so much fish is coming to us from abroad? And he said, who's the broad? Um, but that was, you know, so this is the kind of people that I normally deal with. Um, but um, but so this book, though, is um, is really um, a more complicated uh, problem that I looked at. Um, basically, it came about, so I started working on this book when I was just turning 47. So I started to, you know, have all of those things that we encounter as we enter the next phase of life. And, you know... <sighs> how do you approach this next phase of life, right? You get into these like insomniatic, soul-searching moments. And this, this phrase came to my mind that, that, you know, here I was approaching 50, and it really was like not just 
another 20 years ahead, but this phrase came to me in the middle of the night, the rind of life, that I'd entered this phase of, 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 of sort of steady decline or maybe even fast decline, and I was having the issues with, with my knees started to act up. Um, uh, my father used to make this joke. He used to say that Karl Marx was misinterpreted. You know, he said from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. But he pointed out that he came up with that phrase probably in his mid-50s. He meant knees, not needs. Knees, knees. So I was having problems with my knees. I was having problems with um, uh, high blood pressure. I was having all of these things. And it suddenly occurred to me that there was this, this, this compound out there that was supposed to address all of these things. Um, I never really intended to write about the omega-3 fatty acid at all. I never wanted to even get near that. I got a C in chemistry. Who else got a C in chemistry? Raise your hand if you got it. Okay, so good. So basically, unless anyone is afraid of buying this book, and I should point out my publisher tells me to remind you that you're here hopefully to buy the book, and I think $27.95, I don't know what it's listed for, but um, uh, I try to write this book in such a way that it is um, for a basically somebody who got a C in chemistry, because that's about as much as I could handle with chemistry. I never wanted to write about chemistry, I never wanted to go on into all these things, but as I got more and more attention for all the fish that I was writing about, Every time I would do an event, every time I would do a reading, every time I would go to a signing, every time I'd do a guided fish dinner, people would always say, well, which of the fish here has the highest omega-3s? And how can I get the omega-3s without getting the mercury? And what da, 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 da. And so I realized it was just like this drumbeat again and again and again. And so there I am in the middle of the night again and again thinking about the rind of life. What am I going to write about? How's, what am, how am I going to deal with this problem of middle age? And again and again, the omega-3 would come up. And... You know, so my father's a psychiatrist. Um, he, you know, is constantly prescribing medication for everybody, including himself. And I, I didn't want to go down that route. Um, and so, again, in this sort of middle of the night panic about middle age, I decided one night that I, I should just plug in um, omega threes may, um, you know, or omega threes might cure blah blah blah. And what's really amazing is that when you plug that in, you get this such a bizarre panoply of things that. Uh, omega threes might do so. A phrase for this, uh, a search for the phrase omega threes may, will will give you may help prevent coronary heart disease, may increase brain volume, may boost sperm competitiveness, may build build muscle in older adults, may prevent some forms of depression, may help lower risk of type two di diabetes, and then there was even one, um, d a diet low in um, omega threes may make teenagers anxious. And so as the father of a teenager, I. I kind of felt like, well, all these things had to be addressed. So it suddenly occurred to me that there was this way that I could look at the ocean through the lens of my midlife crisis. That if, what if I were to do this really deep dive into omega-3s and what they do both in the human body, but what they do in the natural environment. So that's a sense, a distillation of what this book, The Omega Principle, is, is about. Um, it's a big kind of sprawling journey um, because... You know, nobody likes to read a book that takes place in a laboratory. Um, uh, there certainly have been other books out there that have kind of done the hard work of looking at the chemistry of omega-3s. Um, but I really didn't want to do that. Um, I'm a reporter. I'm, I think of myself as a shoe leather type reporter. Um, you know, I don't shy away from the long, difficult trip aboard the long, smelly uh, fishing boat all through the night. And so that's something that I really wanted to do with this book. The problem was... The moment I started researching this book, um, literally as I was putting the first pen to paper, all of these studies started coming out from all of these different journals, the Journal of the American Medical Association, New England Journal of Medicine, all of these different studies started coming out one by one saying that omega-3 fatty acids seem to have no effect whatsoever on cardiovascular health. Um, giant meta-analyses that um, looked at thousands and thousands of patients seem to show that there was no effect whatsoever. And of course, you know, so when you're a writer and you make it public, I, a suggestion, if you ever decide to write a book, don't really make it public what you're writing about. Because chances are, I mean, well, who here would like to write a book someday? Like, raise your hand if you'd like to write a book. So there's always a few, right? So basically, when you're amongst, amongst writers, writers, other writers would prefer that you didn't write your book. So if you do have an idea for a book, maybe keep it to yourself. Because one of the least supportive 
kind of groups of people tend to be writers. So, like, a so, so no sooner had I told various writer friends that you know I had this book about omega threes, as soon as the New New England Journal of Medicine and uh, the uh, Journal of American Medical Association showed no effect of cardio on cardiovascular disease of omega threes, suddenly all these emails from my writer friends came out saying, "Well, did you hear omega threes don't work? Do you did you hear omega threes don't work?" So. That became the sort of central problem that I was tussling with, that here I was trying to research this miracle con compound that turned out to be not so miraculous. I think you'll find, when you pick up a copy of the book, that it's not as simple as that. And the, the, the thing that, you know, it's, it's really, um, I would say, a, a piece of advice if you are thinking about writing a book, the good thing about the omega-3 is it's this incredible spider of a molecule um, or a series of molecules, rather, that branches out into so many different parts of both um, environmental science and anatomy and physiology that no matter where you turn, it's always going to be dip something doing something interesting. Um, I like to say that the omega-3 is the Forrest Gump molecule. Because, like, remember who here has seen or read Forrest Gump? Raise your hands. Okay, good. So you never know. Like, when you're with millennials, they're like, Forrest who? Um, but, you know, but remember Forrest always, like, shows up. Like, he'll be there, you know, in, in fighting in Vietnam or he's playing ping pong in China as Nixon is doing his summit in China. So, and, but you're never quite sure, is Forrest doing something or is something happening while Forrest is there? That's kind of the situation with the omega-3 fatty acid. For example, so um, I try in the book to kind of tell a little bit about the history of omega-3s, like where they came from, where they, you know, wh who invented them or what invented them. I think most people would say, right, if I said, what makes omega-3 fatty acids, what would you say? fish, right? Not true. Turns out it's not true at all. Fish don't make them. Fish pass them along, more or less. I mean, they can do a little bit of what's called elongation of fatty acid chains, but basically fish pass them along just like they pass along mercury and PCBs. So the creatures that really make omega-3 fatty acids are actually algae or, or microscopic phytoplankton, microalgae or phytoplankton, the same, same thing, different name. So these creatures invented the omega-3 fatty acid actually to deal with climate change, but not the climate change that we're experiencing, and yes, we are experiencing now, but not the, the direction that we're experiencing now, but the opposite direction. So hundreds of millions of years ago, when photosynthetic phytoplankton first appeared, um, one of the first jobs they did was to strip huge amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequester it in their little bodies. Um, what happens, though, when you remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? gets cooler, right, so it got cooler. So suddenly, you have all these little creatures vibrating around, moving all over the place, that are suddenly in a much colder environment. So they needed to invent something that would help them adapt to a colder climate. So they invented the omega-3 fatty acid. And the omega-3 fatty acid is contained within the membranes, it's often within the thylakoid membranes of photosynthetic creatures. Um, they have two double bonds between their carbon bonds and that I won't go into it because partially I don't understand it, but I won't go into it because um, it's very complicated. But more or less what happens with omega-3s is that they're really dynamic and they're constantly shifting and moving. And it makes those membranes much more pliable in cold temperatures. So in effect, they, cre they, evolved, they created the omega-3 to evolve and adapt to a, a cooler environment. So this is all in the opening chapter of the book, um, which is called Algae's Tools. And so you could say that the omega-3 is the tool of it, that algae used to adapt to a new environment. But it's kind of a double meaning, because we writers love double meanings. Um, algae's tools, I mean. Because when you think about it, what has algae happened to all that phytoplankton over all those hundreds of millions of years? Well, it sank to the bottom of the ocean, and what did it create? Oil, petroleum. Who remembers that? Like, remember that commercial in the '70s? I think it was an Exxon commercial where you see these dinosaurs walking around, and then they suddenly are transformed into an oil well, pumping oil. And so there's this idea that oil comes from the dinosaurs. Not really true. It comes from phytoplankton. Like, I think Exxon would have a hard time selling phytoplankton. I uh, don't think it would really appeal. Um, so anyway, all of that. Those same creatures that invented the omega-3 fatty acid sank to the bottom, and all those energy-rich carbon bonds got turned into, trans uh, into petroleum over the years. Now, we're burning all that petroleum and releasing it back into the atmosphere. So what are we? Algae's tools, 
right? Because what we're essentially doing is re-releasing all of that carbon into the atmosphere, recreating the environment that all those microalgae liked when there was lots of carbon in the atmosphere. So there's just a little digression. I was, you know, in sort of like weird moments, also in the middle of the night, like, oh my God, what if, what if the humans are not controlling the climate at all? What if we're just part of some giant sick algae loop and, 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 and we're, we are algae tools? So anyway, so that's one interesting digression. Um, Another interesting digression. So I'm telling you the, the 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 mostly what's happened at the beginning of the book. I'm um, hoping because there's a little some dense stuff at the beginning, so you can skip over it and just start into the next chapter, which is in the Mediterranean, which is really nice. But um, another interesting moment that happens in early history, not early history in terms of the planet, but early history in terms of humans, is that omega-3 fatty acids um, have an interesting connection to the very shape of the human, the very shape and the very uh, construction of the human brain. So I was, I was sort of looking around for kind of taglines to say in a talk, because when talking about a book, is always very different from writing a book, because you like, what what kind of, what are these immediate things that land? But I, I read, some, I think it might have even been in a Wikipedia entry that it said the human brain. The human brain is a piece of fat on a stick, which is basically true. The human brain is mostly fat. And actually 10% of the human brain is DHA omega-3 fatty acid. It's pretty interesting, right? Like that there's this huge chunk of the brain that is actually made from this stuff that comes from marine stuff. Um, so there's some cool ways, cool avenues that you can explore. There's lots of omega global theories out there. And I should say, so when I was working on this book, uh, I was kind of like, I never knew who to totally believe on this stuff because there's a lot of charlatans there's a lot of real scientists but i was trying to how do i describe all this 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 sort of universe of people that are clinicians and researchers and charlatans and pill pushers and snake oil salesmen how do i describe them all and i actually went to the conference of the global organization for epa and dha fatty acids in at the ritz carlton in the canary islands believe it or not tough assignment but Overall, what I decided to call all these people is Omega World. So like they are just, that's what they do is Omega World. And, and the more you sort of journey through the world of dietary supplements, you realize like that every element, your prebiotics, your probiotics, your anti-inflammatories, your inflammatory, everything, everybody has their own world. You know, there's like, there's the antioxidant world, there's, and, and there's Omega World. So anyway, back to where I went or was going. So Omega World has lots of theories about why the omega-3 is so central to our lives and why we should all be having more omega-3s. Um, one of them is really interesting, which is that, who here read the book Sapiens? Anybody read that one? So good, well, at least, at least a couple. So it's a great book. Um, it's much thicker than mine and I think maybe more expensive, so you should buy this one for $27.95. Um, so uh, he makes a very interesting point. It's basically a history of the human race, of the human species. And he makes the point so we seem to have a, you know, appeared as modern Homo sapiens something like 300,000 years ago. For the first 270, 80,000 years, not much to show for it. You know, some stone tools, killed a bunch of land animals, dug some caves, et cetera, et cetera. Not much. Suddenly, somewhere between 60 and 20,000 years ago, there is what's called what what the author of Sapiens calls the cognitive revolution, and suddenly you start seeing. Um, all these different things starting to appear, like agriculture, uh, like um, the making of more complex tools, uh, advanced language, that actually all starts to happen around 10,000 years ago, 10 to 15,000 years ago. But what's interesting is that there is this strange uh, sort of correspondence because what also happens around that same time, humans start eating seafood. So why did we start suddenly eating seafood? It could be because we were very good at killing land food. Um, we killed a lot of animals in the course of our first 270,000 years on this planet. But right around 30 to 10,000 years ago, you start to see enormous shell piles um, that were pulled out of the water by humans. And then there are these other kind of correlation things that go on. Like there's a place called Pinnacle Point in South Africa where they found giant, giant, some of the earliest shell piles, giant piles of shells that were clearly pulled out of the ocean by humans. And then you also start to see really advanced cave paintings. So Omega World says, well, there was seafood and there were cave, cave paintings. Therefore, seafood caused the cave paintings. This is like this problem of correlation versus causation is the biggest problem that I found in this entire book. And when I went 
to the um, Global Organization of EPA and DHA Fatty Acid Conference in the Canary Islands. Um, everyone was in a state because these big meta-analyses had just come out that basically proved that their entire industry, or said that their entire industry was bunk. Like all these cardiovascular disease studies said, nope, doesn't work. So people were like, you could see literally steam coming out of the ears of some of these people at this conference. They were very, very upset. What they kept saying was there's so many studies, so many studies show an effect of omega-3, so many studies, 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 studies. You know, and <laughs> I remember I was talking to a mother, a, a friend who's a parent of some kids that we know, who said oftentimes she'll back up what she says. Studies show that you should eat your vegetables. So studies, you know, we as Americans, I think, are particularly um, uh, prone to being victims of studies. So what is a study and what study works and what study doesn't work? Well, it turns out that when you look at the vast amount of studies that are done on omega-3 fatty acids, that most of them concern uh, are what are called associative studies. In other words, um, people with low degrees of cardiovascular disease, like, for example, the Inuits in Greenland um, that so famously were studied in the 70s and 80s that led us to these conclusions, those people have very low rates of cardiovascular disease. Um, they eat a lot of seafood. Therefore, seafood causes the low cardiovascular disease. Scientists, is that a correct conclusion? Not necessarily. What it is is it's an opening for doing further studies. Because if you take an association study to the wrong degree, to the furthest degree, my father, a psychiatrist, points out that there's this um, test they had used to do when he was in medical school on schizophrenics. You go, uh, I live in a White House. The president lives in a White House. Therefore, I am the president, right? So it doesn't really work. It doesn't really work. So what um, I ended up doing then in the course of the book was trying to understand like what, what makes a good study. Like where did these studies come from? Where, what, what, what works, what doesn't work in terms, how do we know that anything does anything? So that is a big part of the book. And incidentally, it also comes into the problem with um, climate change as well, and with some of these big studies that people are doing around nature itself. Because we're with humans, so the, 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 the studies that actually show the biggest amounts of effect, and I should say, my partner just got her PhD in statistical genetics, so congratulations, Esther. Um, she um, you know, spends a lot of time looking at these studies, and so she was saying to me that when you're a statistician and you're looking at the so-called evidence pyramid, the thing that is the really most, the thing that really drives medical research are what are called uh, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized control trials. And what that means is that I'm going to give Jane uh, an omega-3 supplement. I'm going to give Anthony a placebo. Uh, we're going to follow them over time. They don't know that they've got which one they've got. I don't know which one they've got. We're going to follow them over time. And it won't even be Jane and Anthony, it'll be two random people, but we will compare them over time and whoever drops dead first determines whether or not the supplement worked or whether it was a placebo effect. So that's more or less, you know, very briefly explained. So in the book, I go into sort of how did randomized control trials appear? How did, actually, believe it or not, the first real documented randomized control trial took place at sea. Um, it happened to do, it happened to, to be involved with scurvy. Um, scurvy, as you probably all remember from high school biology, is caused from a deficiency in vitamin C. And so this doctor aboard this ship where people were dropping dead of scurvy did the first randomized control trial where he gave uh, one guy a bottle of vinegar. Actually, he had pears. Two guys a bottle of vinegar, two guys some salt, two guys some other things, and then two other guys got like a lemon and an orange. And the guys with the lemon and the orange didn't have their teeth fall out and they actually survived. So that's where it all comes from. But um, ultimately, because I wanted this book to be not just about the really small world of like, what can I take to make my joints better? I really wanted it to be about the ocean, and I really wanted it to be about the future of what would be sustainable and what would be a sustainable way of eating. And what I kind of came to the conclusion of is that omega-3s, while it's still doubtful whether or not they work as a supplement and whether or not they actually grow our brains or whether or not they keep us from dropping dead of a heart attack, they are very present in what I would consider healthful food systems. So if you look at food systems that trend towards the omega-3, what do these tend to be? These tend to be um, fisheries um, with healthy estuaries, with healthy biosystems that are producing abundant amounts of fish. Um, Omega-3s tend to be leafy greens. Um, the short-chain omega-3s come to us from leafy greens that are often produced on small farms. Um, there's a whole range of things that are, I would call, an omega-3-friendly world. But then on the other side of things are 
the Omega-6 world. So you didn't know that there was a villain to this story, but it is, it's the Omega-6, the dreaded Omega-6. So Omega-6s, turns out, so Omega-3s and Omega-6s are both essential fatty acids, but it turns out that they actually compete in the human body. Um, we actually wouldn't need to eat that much seafood, the theory goes, if we didn't eat so much omega-6s. Because what happens is, so there are what are called short-chain alpha-linolenic acids that are coming to us, omega-3 is coming to us from plant-based sources. Those short chains not, aren't that um, useful to us. Um, they're not what is part of our brains. But it turns out that the human body can actually elongate a vegetable source of omega-3 into these longer chain EPA and DHA fatty acids. If, however, there are large amounts of omega-6s in the system, those impede the elongation process and actually lead the body in the direction of inflammation. Who here has like heard about inflammation on the news? Right, it's like everything is. is you know, there's a, a great article that I read that Jerome Groupman wrote called called "The Inflamed" in the New Yorker, and he was saying how like you know, from best-selling books to you know miracle cures, everyone and everything is inflamed. So that's you know a major through line throughout the book. But in any case, generally speaking, the omega six way of eating, and what would that include? That includes um, soy and corn oil. Uh, feedlot beef, all these kinds of things that you know, processed foods, those all lead us in the direction of omega-6. Now, whether or not omega-3s and omega-6s and that competition between the two, whether it is essential or not, is up for debate. And I should say, that, of course, the people in omega world um, think that it's absolutely essential, that the competition between omega-3s and omega-6s. Is... Then I've talked to other people like Walter Willett at Harvard, who is a big sort of founder, foundational thinker about the Mediterranean diet. And he said to me, the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is totally bunk, and it doesn't mean anything. So, you know, what are you to make of this? Well, what I tried to do was to kind of look at what are omega-3 systems and what are omega-6 systems, and what do they bring with them? You know, omega-3s tend to bring us seafood that is low in fat, low in calories, high in protein, high in nutrients, uh, with a minimum of actually environmental disruption. It turns out that growing fish or catching fish is so much more carbon efficient than anything that we produce on land. Meanwhile, these omega-6 systems... Uh, which range, you know, as I say, feedlot beef, corn, soy, all these kinds of things require us to do extremely intensive agriculture, extremely uh, carbon-intensive agriculture, lead us in the direction possibly of inflammation, but certainly lead us in the direction um, of overeating, certainly leading us in the direction of um, too much uh, high fructose corn so syrup in our blood, to all these negative health associations that may or may not be associated with omega-6. So that's the way I sort of kind of dodged the whole question. Um, I won't go on for too much longer here because I love to take your questions, and I find that sometimes it's uh, easier to get through a lot of these issues in a in a Q and A. But I guess what I'd say is that in the end, with this book, what I tried to do was to understand um, the omega three not just as this miracle cure, but as the component as a component of 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 how we might reconsider rebalancing our lives. And I'll just read a little, you know, a couple pages from the very end of the book. Um, which kind of shows you where I ended up. Um, when I f reflect on the funk that had driven me to the omega-3s in the first place, I realized that much of it is the result of my own misguided thinking. I had fretted over the looming threat of middle age and grown fearful that I had backed myself into a creative and professional corner. I'd felt banished to the sea and seafood, a niche that occupied only a fragment of the Amer average American's consciousness. I had wanted to move beyond the ocean and to explore and report on a much wider world. But funnily enough, my plunge into that most arcane subject the ocean had to offer, omega-3 fatty acids, had thrown a tether out to the wider world. That we were all born of the ocean and that we all carry the ocean in our cell membranes is something that I had passively known. But now I knew that this bond was much more intense and vital and played itself out in the millions of chemical bonds that coursed through my blood and my brain. Knowledge of this chemical connection brought into sharper re relief the way we have misused land and sea alike and upset the e equilibrium of the very climate upon which we depend. All this stirred a desire to make a struggle to regain this equilibrium central to the time I had remaining. When I remembered all the people I had met in my Omega journal journey, the algae probers, the ice core drillers, the river monitors, the biotech synthesizers, I realized that each was in his or own way engaged in that same struggle. Curiously, all of them were well into their 40s, 50s, and 60s, the omega end of their life's journey, if you will. I should say omega-3 fatty acids are called omega-3 fatty acids because they're three carbons in from the end, so the omega end of their lives. All these scientists and innovators were each very different, but they all shared one indubitable quality. 
They refused to believe in phases. For them, there was no rind of life. From the early years of consciousness on through Indian summer, life was one whole fruit. By cultivating an appetite to eat through every layer of that fruit, skin and core and all, the people who most successfully maintained their vigor cultivated a celebration of life's complexity. The storms they encountered, the difficult difficulties that threatened to level them, they approached them with all with curiosity, a deep faith in the scientific method, and an unending belief in the necessity of forward momentum. Even, the fa even in the face of cataclysm, their central mission was to realize completely lived lives. Only the truly unhealthy would look at their lives in terms of phases, each with their own diagnosable afflictions, curable by a single compound. The true antidote is careful, complex thought and full engagement, a const constant, robust, sometimes futile feeling striving towards balance. So thank you. So I'll take a, take a few questions, um, and, uh, or, or not, but if you, uh, let me know if you, and, and we can talk, I should say, this book is ostensibly about omega-3 fatty acids, but since I've written these two other books, Four Fish and American Catch, I'm happy to take any fish questions. So fire away. So yeah. two questions. Yeah. What do you eat and why? Yeah. And what is your greatest fear about the future? Of the All right. Good, good questions. So what do I eat and why? So, so I, um, in the course of working on this book, um, I actually sold the book to Frontline and did a special called The Fish on My Plate. And um, I should say another piece of advice, never sell the rights to a book that you haven't written yet. So f throughout the whole thing, like I, I, so what happened was I was, I was, um, I was at a, uh, doing a speaking thing at WGBH, and this sort of elegant older man um, with a South African accent said, I'd really like to, to work with you on, your on, your, on a film or something, because I really like your books. And I'm like, uh, OK. And then later on, it turned out to be David Fanning, who created Frontline. And so we went off on this whole journey. And he kept saying, send me your, send me your work. Send, send me your work. I want to see what you're working on. So I'd send him the work, and he'd, he'd read it. And he'd say, I don't think you're, you're Omega thing is working. And he kept saying it over and over again. So it was like sending me this like constant panic. But to your question, one of the things that we did um, for this front line, it actually ended up, it was, it was being, a, ended up, started out being a major theme in the book, which I let largely cut out. But in the front line, I went on an all fish diet for a year where I ate fish for every single meal, uh, pretty much for more than a year, probably 13 or 14 months. Um, and I did my blood work before and I did my blood work afterward. What I found was absolutely no change. So I ha had all the standard markers of triglycerides, all those kinds of things, um, heart rate, da 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 Nothing was particularly affected. So it was kind of dispiriting. The other thing that I found was that I had very high mercury levels. Um, at the time, and, and you know, I have to say, I started out like just eating all fish. I was eating tuna, da 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 And tuna, by the way, is the largest source of mercury in the American diet today. So after an intermediate study, an intermediate uh, test, halfway through found that I had pretty high mercury levels. So I backed off and away from tuna, but I still ate fish every day and I still had high mercury levels. And I, I went, I remember I went to, um, I was, it was in Alaska and I was uh, talking with this public health guy who did mercury testing on Inuit populations. And I told him what my mercury levels are, were. And he said, yeah, if I got mercury levels on one of my ha hair samples from you, I would, I would send somebody out to your village and tell you to stop eating so much whale blubber. So, um, after the year was over, I decided to back off seafood. And, and really, the conclusion I came to from the epidemiological research around diets was that the ideal diet wasn't seafood all the time. Wasn't, it wasn't pescatarianism. It was what I came to the conclusion in this book, what I call the pescatarian diet. And, and what does that mean? Well, so the Mediterranean diet tells us um, the very early studies in 1948. It's a sort of interesting digression. So 1948, Leland Albao on the... Um, uh, from on the invitation of the Greek government, went to Crete to study um, basically the health of the Cretan population, because after two, after two, after World War and after a um, civil war, the Crete, the Greek government was really afraid that the people of Crete were really really unhealthy. So he did the study of everything that they ate, and he found out the average Cretan was living five years longer than the average American, had no cardiovascular disease, no chronic disease, hardly any cancer. So um, and of course the recommendation, and so he looked at what they were eating. They were hardly eating any meat at all. Um, they were eating a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruit, a lot of whole grains. But for some reason, it all got muddied up, and his recommendation to the Greek government was that um, they should have more meat. 
um, because people wanted more meat. But it turns out that actually, um, this was later backed up by Ansel Keys, who did the famous seven country studies. And he found across populations that generally speaking, low rates of meat consumption, um, high rates of vegetable consumption was pretty much the ideal of what you were looking for. Later on, and I do this a little bit in the book, big meta-analyses of multiple dietary patterns seem to indicate that a Mediterranean diet with a strong fish component might be the ideal diet, both from an environmental point of view and from a physiological point of view. So the pescatarian diet is both mostly vegetarian, a couple meals of seafood a week, and the meals of seafood that I eat focusing on bivalves, mussels, clams, oysters, maybe once a week, and then lower trophic fish, things like sardines, anchovies, and so forth that are normally used, boiled down into animal field and di dietary supplements, but actually make for very good nutrition for us. The other question was my biggest worry for the future is that we don't address the problem of our dietary imbalance both for us and for the planet. Um, I think if we can continue going on with business as us usual, planting trillions of pounds of um, corn and soy every year, not caring about riverine estuaries, and not caring about the tremendous carbon impact that agriculture has upon the world, because after energy production, food production is the second largest con contributor to greenhouse gases. So if we don't address that, food will have a major role in messing up this verdant place that we love and we love to eat from. So thank you. Yeah. Um, relating to the future of fish, you were mentioning how harvesting all the little fish for this big omega-3 industry yeah. is, you know, disrupting the food chain of the big fish. I was wondering how that meshed with the prevalence of endocrine disruptors in the world, um, you know, and the ability of fish to reproduce themselves mm -hmm. and just, you know, sort of generally, what is the Scotch guard in my sofa doing to me? <laughs> yeah. Good question. Um, well, first of all, I didn't, so um, I didn't directly address the, the whole reduction industry in my talk. It's very much a part of the book, but just a word or two about that, because I'm glad you raised that. So basically, between 20 and 25 million metric tons of fish every year is reduced um, into um, fertilizer, primarily animal feed, and yes, dietary supplements. Just to give you kind of a metric to compare that to, all the fish that we take out of the ocean every year is 80 million metric tons. So a quarter, more or less, of all the fish we catch is boiled down into dust and oil and never really crosses the human plate, which I think, you know, there are a lot of people who, from individual fisheries who say they're being well managed. Um, here in the Chesapeake area, Menhaden is a very big fish. Um, there's one company that takes all the Menhaden, uh, takes pretty much all of the total allowable catch. Um, they claim that they're, you know, very sustainable. And then the people in Peru, where I went to, the largest fishery in the world, they said that they were sustainable. But you could say this is sustainable, that is sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. But what would it mean if we had 25 million extra tons of life in the ocean? every single year. Surely that would meet a more abundant ocean. So that's that's the reduction question. Your larger question about endocrine disruptors, that is a big question for all of marine life, not just the reduction industry. So certainly from pharmaceuticals that are going into our sinks and our toilets, um, microfibers that are causing, um, that are showing up actually in the guts and intestines of fish. Um, these are all issues that are certainly interfering with fish and interfering with the production of fish. It's hard to say, though, how they are and to what degree they are. And also, it's hard to say um, exactly what they're causing to human health. When I've delved into the whole plastic waste issue, for example, I have really yet to come across a study that said the plastic waste that's going into the water is actually causing noticeable health effects in humans. It could be because a lot of these, um, uh, the, the, uh, the plastic fibers are actually lipophilic, and so they will attract things like PCBs and so forth. It's the plastics themselves may not actually be poisoning our fish, but the fact that they can attract things like PCBs might make it a vector for PCBs showing up in our, in our fish populations. I think it's too early to say what exactly is happening. The endocrine disruption is certainly a big thing. Um, you know, fish actually are very quick to change gender. Um, one thing I heard interestingly from a, fi uh, a fisheries person that if Finding Nemo had been told according to actually how biology works, if um, what would have really happened is that after Nemo's mother was eaten by the barracuda, 
Nemo would have changed genders and mated with his father. So that that's that's really how how fish work, and they're very quick to change gender. There's actually you know even a mnemonic among fishery uh, a memory uh, cue for fisheries people. Um, often water temperature will change gender. So the way that you remember that as a fisheries biologist is hot chicks and cool dudes. Hot water causes <laughs> chicks and cool water causes dudes. So that's pretty much it. So, you know, the endocrine stuff, it's a lot, you know, you can go into layers upon layers upon layers of this, which I won't do right now, but I'm happy to talk about it later if you want. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. So um, you mentioned about aquaculture and sort of crossing over between getting more food from the wild, more seafood from the wild versus aquaculture. And I just wanted you to sort of talk to us a little bit about issues around sustainability in aquaculture. I know you've written about that before. Yeah. And, you know, people are concerned about shrimp and mangrove, def you know, loss of mangroves and greenhouse gases. And then there's some folks who think that, you know, uh, bivalves and clams, that aquaculture at a different trophic level could be hugely sustainable. So go ahead. Thank you, Maura. I appreciate it. That's, <laughs> that's like, that's like the gift on a, the question on a platter. But yeah, so first of all, it was interesting uh, in the course of this book, of course, I, I'm always trying to get both sides of the story. I don't want to just get it from the greens or the or the industry people are trying to tack an equal course but there was an interesting switch in all of this so there's a guy named steve Gaines at the university of california santa barbara he's head of the brain the Bren school there and steve is like one of the big thinkers around what are called marine protected areas and helped establish the largest network of marine protected areas in california but steve when he moved over to head the Bren school he suddenly had to look at sort of much larger questions of environmental policy and when he started comparing different food systems, he started working with um, a guy named Dave Tillman, who's a big thinker on ecology, and they started looking at food systems. They realized that generally speaking, what we grow in water is almost uniformly better than what we grow in land from a carbon perspective, from a fresh water use perspective, and from um, an open space perspective. So all of these things suddenly made him this guy who was always in favor of wild fish and da da da, was like, made him like, whoa, we really need to be thinking about this aquaculture piece. So what Mora mentioned is important too, which is that classically, typically what Americans eat when they're eating aquaculture, they tend to be eating farm salmon. And farms, you know, salmon are a carnivorous fish. Um, they require other fish to bring them to market, which is why we're reducing so many millions of tons of anchovies every single year. Um, but things like clams, mussels, and oysters actually grow big, fat, and delicious and omega-3 rich. I should say mussels are a really great omega-3 rich food um, by filtering the water of phytoplankton. And this actually can have tremendous biological benefits because phytoplankton bloom when there's a lot of nitrates in the water. If there's too much phytoplankton, they will die, get decomposed, and in the process suck oxygen from the water. So you've heard all heard about the dead zones. Like dead zones are actually caused by too much phytoplankton in the water. So if you have this kind of aquaculture that actually strips that from the water before it can deoxygenate the water, that's really good. Uh, bivalves, these things, um, clams, mussels, oysters, they also create structure for fish that are really great habitats. So when we talk about aquaculture, there's a whole range of things that we could do that don't necessarily involve us grinding up a lot of fish. That said, I know everybody isn't going to want to immediately start eating a lot of clams, mussels, and oysters. There's the kosher issue. And believe me, we can go to Terry Gross for some reason. We did a deep dive on kosher on, on seafood on NPR. And I'm like, am I, what is going on here? It actually turned out that Terry Gross grew up two blocks from my grandparents on Avenue X. So, you know, that's maybe why. So anyway... Um, so there's the kosher issue. Um, you can actually grow fin fish in a, in a way that is much more sustainable. I go into it in the book. There are many ways that we could change this sort of reductionist system. And as I say, it's all in the book. You can read about that. I won't go into it now. But I do think aquaculture has tremendous p potential. Um, it's the fastest growing food system in the planet, probably. The United States, even though we control more ocean than any country on earth, we're actually 17th, um, in terms of total volume produced by uh, aquaculture, we're behind North Korea in total pounds of aquaculture produced. So that's pretty lame. So I think we could fix that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, thanks for coming. Yeah. I was wondering what the most interesting experience you had or the most interesting person you met when you were researching in the book. So good question. Most interesting experience, most interesting person. So um, I have a soft spot for Jorn Dyerberg, who is the um, Danish guy who went to Greenland for the first time and discovered this correlation between omega-3 fatty acids and Inuit health. Um, I liked him because I could imagine being him because he was just the guy who was just in cardiology. You know, he 
he didn't have any particular connection to Inuits or whatever. And suddenly his supervisors are said, read an article in the Danish journal saying that they found very low rates of cardiovascular disease. And so Dr. Bang was like, Jorn, let us go. We must go to Greenland and discover everything we can. So, and, and Jorn is this very unassuming Dane. He's like, okay, Dr. Bang, I go to, to, know, to, to Greenland. So they went and, you know, he had this incredible adventure. So this sort of mild-mannered, meek physician totally opened up and flowered. And he actually, in the course of um, um, interviewing him, he, I interviewed him twice, once at the conference for uh, for fatty acids and once at his lab in Denmark. And his, he brought me his diary. And his diary was bound in the seal skin of one of the seals that one of the Inuit hunters had shot. And he opened it up and it was like this, it was like, I think I say in the books, it was big and rare as a Gutenberg Bible. Like it was just full of these pictures from another world. And the way they stumbled upon it was like, he was like, this is probably the last time we'll ever be able to test the blood of a hunter-gatherer civilization that has not been affected by the Western diets, in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. So it was like this incredible discovery. So that was really amazing. The bookend to that is that for this book, I ended up going not to Greenland, but to Antarctica, um, which is actually the source of um, krill. And krill is the largest single species animal biomass in the world. It's also the target of the supplement industry. So that was amazing. Um, uh, uh, Antarctica is like just this very incredible place where you, it's one of the only places in the world where you feel as a human in the, in the vast mi minority and just overwhelmed by col colonies of penguins and seals in this living, breathing ecosystem. So I strongly recommend that everybody should get to Antarctica if they can, hook or by crook. You actually can show up at Ushuaia. You know, you, when you see the ads for Antarctic cruises, they're very expensive. But if you wanted to show up in Ushuaia in Argentina, there are all these boats where people don't show up for one other reason. So if you want to do a sort of risky approach to Antarctic tourism, you can do that. <laughs> so that's my advice. Go south, young man. <laughs> anyway, thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, how much does the industry drive the research, and how did the industry react to the study as associating um, omega-3 with prostate cancer? So yeah, good question. Um, so the industry does drive the um, d does drive the research to a certain degree. But one of the things I found out from my partner Esther, who is doing her statistics research, is that industry is everywhere in medical research. And it's one of the reasons, one of the other push pull things that I came up or that I got into in the book is that you know, we're bananas for supplements in this country. It's a 34 billion dollar industry. And it's this it's this weird industry that developed in very strange ways. You know, most of the supplement companies are based in Utah. And I sort of wondered out loud on Facebook one time, why is it all the 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 supplement companies are in Utah? Mormons going door to door. So the whole door-to-door -door salesmanship of vitamins and so forth came out of Utah. And actually, it was Orrin Hatch who pushed through something called the Proxmire Amendment to the Food and Drug Administration's Act, which basically created this third category that is neither food nor drug, and that is supplements, and which basically allows is able to sail through with very little in the way of regulation or testing. That said, fish oil and omega-3 supplements are kind of on the edge. They're in between supplements and medicine. There are actual medical prescriptions for fish oil that you can get. Um, many of the studies are funded by industry. There are some that are not funded by industry. Um, what the industry tends to do when they hear negative words is flood your email box or your inbox with association studies. Like they can't usually back up um, what has been found through a randomized control trial, although I've been having these ever since the book came out. The Global Organization for EPA and DHA Fatty Acids can't stop um, sending me stuff about show. No, there are this randomized control trial. Um, the prostate cancer stuff. So there was this finding a few years ago that linked omega threes with with prostate cancer. I'm, you know, again on a C and chemistry level um, analysis of it. I think that the evidence linking prostate cancer to omega-3 supplements is pretty weak. Um, you know, one time Esther and I were up late and she found this site where you can do associations between this and that, like number of chickens in a city with um, panic disorder. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you can, you can, and so you, you can take any two things and say there's this and there's this. So I kind of tend to think that, the, and, and also the other thing that I found when I was looking through this whole thing is the presence, the kind of ghost presence of medical researchers trying to get noticed. So they would look for associations, look for things that would make 
things kind of jump out at you. And even the meta-analysis that JAMA did showing no cardiovascular effect, when I actually sat down with a statistician and picked through it, there were actually points at which, you know, among the six or seven different vectors of cardiovascular disease, one of them is sudden death. So who knew that this was actually a cause of it? But there's this thing. So I, I just a, a phrase from the book. Um, I won't quote it for, maybe I won't quote it for, oh, yeah, here, I found it. Um, a little while back, I learned from an eminent cardiologist that half of, all fa half of all patients first report heart disease to their doctors by dropping dead. Like, it's the largest cause of death, um, natural death in the United States is, is sudden death. And actually, when they looked at that meta-analysis, you know, stroke didn't really show anything, heart didn't show anything, but actually sudden death, there seemed to be a certain amount of correlation between omega-3 supplementation and sudden death. So, anyway, yeah, Anthony. I look forward to reading your book. Thank you. I was just wondering, do you think that supplements are fundamentally bogus? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know my, I went to my cardiologist, and he's like, I want you to start taking CoQ10. I'm not sure what that is, but. Yeah. And then also, and throw in some D3. Yeah. And I just sort of was wondering, since you spent so much time looking at the supplement industry, one has to wonder. Well, you know, whenever I hear that word bogus, and, and I always think about Jeff Spicoli, you know, in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. What Jefferson said is these rules are bogus. Unless we get some cool rules pronto, we'll just be bogus too. But I, I kind of feel that's true about unless we get some cool rules pronto with supplements, we will be bogus too. Because I think part of the whole problem is there's not a lot of medical trials around supplements. Um, one of the things I realized amidst all of this is that physicians are just he people. And my doctor, you know, he regularly recommends omega-3 fatty acids. Um, in the middle of my research, he had a heart attack. He had a massive heart attack on a train platform in Berlin. And I saw him, you know, the next month, and he was really shaken. He's like, how did I let myself have a goddamn infarction? I'm a doctor, for Christ's sake. <laughs> you know, so the world is mysterious, and, um, and doctors really don't know. And sometimes I think there's a push and pull between patients. Like patients, they've heard of curcumin. And, and the doctor says, oh, well, you know, and there's always some studies they can read that show curcumin and chicken, you know, like that seem to associate it. So um, I also think I was sitting down with Marian Nessel the other day. Anyone ever read the work of Marian Nessel? So, you know, fabulous woman uh, who's done amazing work around nutrition and so forth. And she's like, you know, the, the placebo effect ain't nothing. Um, and in fact, in the book I talk about, there was an actual foundational treatise about the placebo effect written like in the 18th century. And mm. it really does work. My father-in-law, his dad had Alzheimer's at 71 and died a horrible, had 20 horrible years and then died. My father-in-law takes every frickin' salt. When, when I said to him, I was writing this book on omega-3s, he's like, all right, listen. Get your pen out. This is what you got to take. I take two grams of this, four <laughs> milligrams of da, 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 And it's like, okay. I have no idea, you know, if any of that works. But here he is. He's 92. He still runs drill construction. He's still building cell phone towers every single day. And he doesn't, you know, he seems to remember stuff. I think the placebo effect is really powerful. So if something can lead you in the direction of the placebo effect in a positive way, Go for it, you know? I mean, the thing is, a lot of supplements just aren't really necessary. Like, the good thing about fish oil and about omega-3s, aside from that prostate thing, which blew up, like, huge in the news, um, there's not a lot of bad about um, omega-3s that they've found. There's some issues with oxidation that can happen. But generally speaking, you know, it's 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 kind of like, uh, remember Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the entry for Earth is mostly harmless. I, I, I think that can be set, probably said of omega-3s. And they might be doing some good, so... One more question. Yes. Hi. Okay. Well, this was the one thing. I mean, I, it was a great talk, and I uh, felt like everything was pretty understandable, except for one thing. Good. That was sperm competitiveness. <laughs> I, I got. Let me it, tell you. Uh, you want to go ahead? So why <laughs> should a guy? Why should a guy care about whether his own sperm are competitive with each other? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. I mean. That one, you know, sort of like, uh, that was just writer gold. You know, like what I put, omega-3s make boosts from competitive, put that in there. Um, what I will say is this. So omega-3 fatty acids after brain cells, the sperm cells are the highest, have the highest amount of omega-3 fatty acids in them. Um, also eggs as well. Seems that omega-3s are very linked to reproduction in one way or another. And again, we're still kind of trying to decode what it is that they do. 
Sperm competitiveness, I don't know. I mean, you know, a lot of the, one of the things I came across in, um, somebody said this to me, and I think it's really true, is that met, in the world of pharmacology, medical research is marketing, right? So, so, so you know, so like it may be completely meaningless that, that, that sperm competitiveness means, it might not mean anything, but like you, you noticed, right? right. You like sperm, how, how like, to like, tell me more. How can like, my sperm compete <laughs> in, this, in this difficult market? Uh, <laughs> like These the type A personalities. Yeah, well, no, like and, and so one of the things that I did in this book, there was a, there's a really great person that I met in this book who did this presentation at the, at the Global Organization for EPA and DHA Fatty Acid Conference in Canary Islands at the Brits Carlton. She did this um, great, um, she had done a, a survey of 2,000 users of omega-3 supplements, and then she'd group them by, by type. And exactly, your type A were the, um, what were they? they, they were, I can't remember, I, I, they're the believers, and they were all grouped up in different ways. And the believers, they had studied medical science, and they knew that this was proof. They had read the proof, and this is going to work. And it turns out in the supplement world, if you can get the believers on board, you're done. You don't have to sell another pill because all the believers will sell it for you. So a lot of the medical marketing, I think, is pointed at getting the believers on board. So anyway, all right, well, thank you so much for coming. Come, um, and yeah, thanks for coming.